Welcome to my guide on diplomacy in Total War Warhammer 2. This video will go over the entire diplomatic screen and explain how every single part works and also how to best interact with other factions to ensure you're getting the best deal every time. Now I know for a lot of you this might seem basic, but some of you might be looking to get into Total War and haven't yet because of the apparent learning curve. Uh, these guys aimed at you, they aim to explain how every single basic thing in the game works so that you have to a much smoother start and can understand my more advanced guides, shameless plug. Diplomacy is one of the core mechanics in Total War across the series, but I'm going to be focusing on Total War Warhammer as it's where I have the most experience and where I'm doing all the gameplay capture. It dictates many things such as your enemies and allies, and it can tell you some very valuable information provided that you can understand it correctly. Let's start by going over what each part of the diplomacy screen means. The middle section of the screen is where you'll spend most of your time in this screen looking, and from here you can see every single race you've discovered, and can interact with all of them from there. From here you can see their strength rank, the number of settlements they have, the treaties that you might have, the trade status, and their relations towards you. Wild target is something we'll come back to later. The strength rank is separated into two parts as you can see here. It's the rank overall, so here we can see that Kislev is 6, and their rank in relation to you. And what this basically means is if all their armies were put together and then put against all your armies put together, this would be the balance of power like you see when you're in battle. So here we see that Kislev and number six were number 11. So if all our armies went against all of theirs in auto resolve, they would win. This doesn't really take into account the types of units that you have. So you can kind of inflate this. If you just get loads and loads of very, very weak armies, you can kind of push this up, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. You should also take this with a huge grain of salt because even if a faction has lots of armies, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're using all these armies very well. Like for example, Kislev could have 13 armies, but they could all be in the far north and I could attack them from the south and suffer no defense whatsoever. So you do have to take it with a grain of salt, but generally if someone is this big and you're this big, then you kind of want to be a little worried. Now a number of settlements might seem pretty straightforward, but you actually want to read into it a little bit more than you'd think. So we can see here, that Kislev also have the most settlements, they have 10, but that doesn't take into account how big the settlements are, how developed they are, how much income they're getting from them, and what they've built in them. So they could have 10 and they're all ruins, or could have 10 and they're all max tier, full defences, bringing in loads and loads of cash, but we don't know that. The trees tab shows you the diplomatic status that you have with all the factions, so here we can see that we've got a non-aggression pact and a military access with Britonia. So if you have a military alliance, then we can use this war target thing, which again, I'll come back to later, but we don't have any of those in this campaign. But an important thing to know is when you get a defensive alliance or a military alliance, it will overwrite non-aggression pact. So just because you don't see it here, it doesn't mean that you don't have it. It's just embedded into that other alliance. The trade status will always show one of three options. As you can see here, as you can see here, trade has a possible route, but you haven't got one yet. And if you hover over it, you will always see the income of what you're going to import and what you're going to export. So for this one, we get 102 just from tariffs because they don't really want to trade anything with us and that's just fine. And they'd import us some dwarf beer, which would be very nice. This one means that a trade route from their capital to yours can't be established. This can mean that you haven't got access through all the lands or they haven't got a port or the enemies are in the way. It can be due to many things, but basically you can't get a trade route with them. And so you can't hover over and find out what the trade route will be. And the final symbol is the green one. And that means trade route is available and you've got it and you're already getting this income that's shown you right here. So that's fantastic. Now there are some factions that cannot trade, the green skins, uh, a lot of horde factions can't trade. The relations you have with another faction is basically how they feel about you. So it's kind of, you know, whether they like you or they don't like you, obviously. So if we if we go to the top, who likes us the most? Ostland likes us the most, 123 relations. And you can see from this big list here of the different things that they like us for. So because we have treaties with them, that helps, you know, build your relationship so they trust you. Uh, if you show support with them in battle, uh, if you declare war against people that they don't like, they appreciate all of these things and it will all go towards improving your relations and letting you get higher and higher up the relationship tree. Uh, since we're playing the Empire here, this is a bit weird, so we'll go to character on. That's a bit more standard. Certain factions can also artificially change the relations. So since we're the Empire here, I can show you this. So we go here and we select uh, what relation we want to affect. This is only between Empire realms, but you know, we can show you an example. So if we want to improve our relations with Avaland, uh, then we click this and we improve our relation it costs us a little bit of this here. Uh, the elven way of doing this uses influence which is good from a number of sources. You can learn more about that in my video right here. Yes. There. The corner. We've got there. Watch it. In the vanilla game, once you get to be extremely powerful, you suffer something called the Great Power Penalty, which basically means that all factions on the map fear you and don't like you because you are so powerful. I personally think that it's a bit pointless, so I tend to edit it out of a mod, but it is definitely something that's worth noting. 
version is another thing that's baked into the core game and it basically means that uh, if your factions have a history of war, so the dwarves and the orcs and basically all the good factions versus all the evil factions, they have a version for each other. So if we go down here and we find the vampires, we have all these things that they don't like as far, which is fair enough. And then at the top you have a version which is minus 30. So it is possible to be friends with them if we really tried, but it is going to be a lot more difficult than being friends with, you know, any of the other factions that we don't have a version with. We might also have it with the orcs. Yes, with the orcs we have minus 40. What else? Minus 10. So you can see here, a lot of these guys just do not like us. Moving away from the central part, we have these two cards on the side here. The left is always going to be your faction, and the right is always going to be the other faction that you're interacting with. Starting with left, we can see our strength rank again, our reliability, our relations with other factions, including military alliances, defensive alliances, wars, and trade partners, as well as any trade goods that we have. Reliability is kind of a weird one. It's basically dictated by how you behave in diplomacy. So if you break all your alliances and declare war on all your friends, then your reliability will drop. But if you have very long-standing agreements and you know you make lots of diplomatic actions and you stand by them, then your reliability will be very high. And what this basically means is when you're interacting with other AI factions, they will either give you a bonus or give you a debuff based on how you're acting. So we have a very high reliability and went to these guys. Now they want a military alliance. If we had a very low reliability, I don't think they'd want that because you know, why would they? They can't trust us. They think that we're just going to stab them in the back, which is a very fair assessment. Been on the wrong shot speed in the camera this whole time. Apologize for that. As you can see, the treaties are divided into enemies, military alliances, and defensive alliances. Since we obviously don't have any of those, we can't see it. If we did, just for example, uh, go into a trade agreement and a military alliance with those guys, you can see they appear there. We'll cover what military alliance means a little bit later on. But for now, you can tell that it's always here. And if you look at anyone else, here we go. So if we look at Bordolo, we can tell they have a defensive alliance with Bastogne and a military alliance with Carcassonne and Paravon. We can also tell they're at war with the Wood Elves and the Dreadfleet. So it's very, very useful. So say I want to get good friends with Bordolo, I can go declare war on those factions or I can get alliances with their alliances and that will help build our relationship further, which is always a good thing. The trade pattern section, again, pretty, pretty self-explanatory. I don't feel like I need to explain that. Basically, you know, who you have traded. You can also check the income from each of these trade things which is very, very useful. And um, we can also down here see our trade resources. So we can see they're exporting marble and we're importing dyes. So we gain access to that and then we can't actually trade it out, but it's very useful to have these in your faction. The card on the right is very similar, but it shows these things for the enemies basically. So you can see they have strength rank, but they don't have reliability. They have something else. They have these traits. And then we can obviously see, you know, as we've covered all their alliances and trade resources. And these traits, uh, they will basically dictate how the AI behaves in general. Whereas we get the reliability, you can behave however you want because you know, you're playing. But the AI, it will kind of stick to this. So, Alberic de Bordelow, he's an underdog. So instead of trying to get to the top of the food chain, this one prefers joining a worthy faction in Confederation, Bretonia. And if we go to Dwarves, they are defensive, so they prefer to maintain their borders rather than expanding out. Uh, they're reliable because, you know, they are all about the grudges. So if they make a grudge for you, then they're not going to be happy with that. So they will basically, once you make a deal with them, it's pretty certain it's going to stick unless you do something pretty dastardly. And of course they hold grudges, as we all know from my dwarf guide, another shameless plug there. Which basically means if you do something bad against them, they are never going to forget it. Look at, look at the orcs here. So they're aggressive, so they are much more likely to attack and declare wars on just anyone. They're unreliable, so any deal you make with them, pretty guaranteed that it's not going to do anything. And of course the underdog, they prefer to confederate rather than doing anything themselves. There are so many of these traits. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory. If you want me to explain them in a separate video, leave a comment down below. I will certainly do that for you if I can. Finally, we come to what you'll be spending most of your time looking at, which is this screen here, which is the deals section. For me, you can offer many diplomatic actions. So we have a non-aggression pact, military access, defensive lines, and military alliance. Uh, we can also pay them, join wars, declare wars. And if we had any trees here, we could cancel them. Non-aggression pact, it's basically a promise that you won't attack each other. You can attack each other, within them, but again, it'll hurt your reliability and no one is gonna really like you if you do that. You can get around if you cancel the treaty, wait 10 turns and then attack them, but it's still gonna hurt your reliability, so you have to be careful with that. Defensive Alliance is the next stage of relationship or second base, if you will. Uh, it basically means that you'll white knight for them, which means if anyone declares war on them, then you will declare war on their enemy. So say there's A and B, they're in a defensive alliance and someone declares war on A, B will jump to their aid or they will break off the alliance and go their own way which A will definitely not appreciate. 
So, you know, they never really want to do that. Uh, from this point onward, I'd only say get these with strong factions that you know you're going to be allies with to the end game. Because if you get a defensive alliance with a weak faction, a lot of people will declare wars on that faction, and then you'll end up in a lot of unnecessary wars that you could have just avoided. So I would only reserve military and defensive alliances for factions that you're going to keep until the end game. Of course, the military alliance is the next step up from that, and that basically means that now, as well as A and B defending each other, uh, if A attacks someone, then B can choose to join them in that war, or again, break off the alliance and move off and, you know, not be friends anymore. Of course, breaking any of these treaties will get you some severe diplomatic uh, relation penalties with the faction that you have to deal with. So you want to be very sure when you're doing this, you don't want to do it hastily. Okay, we have to quickly switch races because the Empire can actually do these next two options. So apologies for the disconnect there. Uh, the final stage of relationship that you can get is to become a vassal. So if you look at Muslan here, we can offer them to become our vassal. It's obviously a low chance because what vassal basically does is they gain your protection. So it's basically a military lines, but they pay you a tribute every single turn based on a percentage of their income. This only generally happens when the faction has no other option. So they'll just beg you to protect them and, you know, keep them from being wiped out and they'll pay you sums of money. You can also do this when you have destroyed the final settlement that a faction has. It's one of the options when you are occupying, sacking, all that good stuff. You can choose to vassalize them from there and then they'll obviously become the vassal. Now, I don't really like doing this because I'd rather just have the land for myself. So if I'm at war with someone, I'll just take the settlement. And if it's someone like this, then I'll either let them die or I'll just get the confederation if they are of my own race. Uh, when you have any of these, the defensive, military or vassal alliance, uh, you can designate war targets. So we have a military alliance with Muslon here. We're both at war with Lioness. What I can do is click on Muslon and I can designate a war target. And what this means is uh, I can tell him where I want him to attack. So if I want him to attack this city, then I can do that. If I want him to attack one of these armies, I can do that. And then these ones here, that will clear it. And then that one will just zoom me over so I can see it. And this is very useful because what you can you can use it many ways. You can tell them to attack to one place while you attack another, so you can kind of pinch them on both sides. Or you can start your attack towards one place and by the time you get there, hope and pray that the AI has actually moved and you both attack the same place at the same time and they'll back you up in the battle and you should win it very easily. Problem is, it's the AI, it doesn't always do this. It'll say, oh yes, I'm attacking and they'll send like a single hero over there to attack, which isn't very useful. So, you know, use it, but don't rely on it. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, a confederation is kind of separate from all other forms of alliance because it's only available within your own race unless you're using some serious mods. Uh, when you confederate someone, you basically gain control over all of their lands. So say we confederated the vampire counts. We have three settlements. So let's say they have three armies. So if I confederated Manfred right now, I'd gain control over his three settlements and I'd gain control over all his armies. And I'd also gain his income and his obviously expenses. So, and since AI plays with cheats for their armies, this would probably mean that I'd end up losing a lot of money. So it's always worth, when you confederate, go through all your armies that you've gained and disband any that you don't need, because otherwise you're just wasting money. And if you just leave it for ages before you notice it, then you know you could have got like five, 10 grand in gold and you never want to be missing out on that. You can only really get away with confederating for most factions when you have a very, very high strength rank and also very, very high relations with that faction. Otherwise, they're just not going to do it. Like, if they have military strength that's at least like, say you are three cores and they have one core, they probably won't accept it unless your relations are stupidly high, just because they don't think it's worth it. They think that they can beat you if, you know, you decide to clear war on them, take their lands. I mean, they're wrong, but that's just what they think. So you need to make sure you have a huge strength advantage over them and fantastic relations. Some factions such as Britonia and the Empire rework that we just saw, um, they confederate in very different ways. Uh, Britonia used the research tree, which is covered in my video, and the Empire used the field system, which is coming in a future video, so stay subscribed if you want to see that. It's also worth knowing that when you do this for basic factions, uh, the aren't Britonia or the Empire, you get some severe debuffs when you confederate. You get minus eight public order, I believe, and also I think it's minus 20 diplomatic relations with factions of the same race. Might need to fact check that, but it's in that ballpark. So you wanna make sure that you're not on the brink of rebellion, otherwise it's gonna severely tip it over the edge. The relations don't really make that much difference cause it's only like five turns. So by the time it's over, you know, you'll gain it back in a couple of turns after that. But it's definitely something worth knowing. Military access is stood by itself and it's pretty self-explanatory. It basically means that 
say I didn't have a military access pact with Manfred here, I could not move my armies inside his borders without him, you know, getting mad at me and our diplomatic relations falling. I do have it, so I can just move around as much as I want. The AI will kind of go where it wants anyway, but this is very good for when you want to take a shortcut through one of your allies' lands and you don't want them to hate you for it. So it's great for building relations. I always recommend doing this if you can with your allies. Trade agreements don't really protect you from anything. Uh, they just get you some money. Uh, they can provide a financial incentive for people not to declare war on you, but it's not that big a deal. If you have a trade agreement with someone, they can declare war on you and there's not really any penalties that they get for that. So that kind of sucks, but you know, it's just the way the cookie crumbles, my friend. I totally believe it's always worth getting as many trade agreements as possible with all the factions because you might as well, you're getting the money from them, it slightly increases the chances that they won't declare war on you because it ups your relations. There's just no point not getting one. Even if it's with someone that you completely hate and you're going to eradicate, you might as well get the money from them while you can. Right, any of these treaties can also be cancelled from this screen, so you can see here it's military line, so I want to cancel it, I'd click this and then I'd confirm it. I don't actually want to do that because I want to be friends with Manfred, but if I was going to do that, I'll do it for an example. So if I did that, click, you can see they already went down 30 and they're going to go down all the way to 7. Like, he bro I broke treaties with him, and I've also lost the bones of the treaties with him. So, it takes me down, like, 120, just like that. So, it is very, very costly for your diplomatic relations if you want to cancel any of these treaties. So, you should always think very carefully about when you can do that. Payments tab is often used as a side part of the deal, rather than the main deal itself. Right, let's say I want a military alliance with these guys. They, it's a moderate chance they might do it. So... I might as well just go into my... Okay, if I do that, it's a high chance. So what I can now do is, well, they want that. So I'm going to demand some payment. So 900 gold, that's moderate. And if I just keep upping it, you can kind of find the middle ground where they'll probably accept it. So 1500, still moderate. 1800, right, that's low. So I'll probably go to this one. And I imagine they'd take that. There you go. So I just got 1200 gold for accepting the deal that they were going to accept anyway. Alternatively, Paragon, they don't really like me. So non-aggression pact with them, it might not work. So what I could do is offer them a payment. So if I have them 300, that's only moderate. 700, that's still moderate. 1,020, still moderate. 1,500, still moderate. Get to about here. It'll eventually go high. Okay, P apparently they don't care about giving me high relations. But basically, this will increase your chances of getting a deal. So if someone isn't accepting a deal, it's always worth like throwing a couple grand their way if you really need it. But if not, you know, it's always useful to extort a little bit of money when uh, when you're trying to get a deal for someone else. Finally, we get to the namesake of the game, wars. Uh, you can declare war with any faction that you want. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't recommend doing it with anyone you've got military alliance with, as I said before. But let's say I want to declare war on Kaxstone. It's as easy as that. I just click this, call my allies to help, and then there is a chance that these guys will come in and join me. And they have no allies, so it's pretty safe doing this. So see, they all joined me in war, and now I'm at war with Fane Chantress. Uh, you can do another thing, uh, which is called join wars which basically means that if someone, if one of your allies is at war with someone else, then you can offer to join that war, and this will get you great diplomatic relations with these guys. Uh, it's another thing that you can use to sweeten the deal, so if someone doesn't want something, you can say, well, if you do this, I will join your war with this person, and it's pretty guaranteed that they're gonna do it. Uh, it's also got another use, so let's find someone here that's got some military alliances. Perfect, Marienburg have a defense of a military alliance, sorry, with Northland and they're at war with the Skull Smashers. Say I want to declare war on Marienburg, but I don't want to declare war on Nordland. What I can do is I can go to these guys and I can join their war against just Marienburg. And then like that, I'm at war with Marienburg, but I'm not at war with Nordland. So I've avoided taking on two factions and I can now take them on one at a time. There's a chance Nordland will declare war on me because I've declared war on their ally, but it at least buys you a turn or two worth of time. Right, that's everything you need to know about the diplomacy screen. If you stuck around till the end, then I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, if you could leave a like, I'd really appreciate it. If you have any questions or noticed anything that I missed, then please do leave it down in the comments below. I try to read them and reply to them as much as I can. If you want to check out my other guides, there are links in the card and description and playlist to my series. If you want to see more videos on Total War Warhammer or strategy games in general, then hit that subscribe button. After all, it is free. For now though, I was Killing Damners, and I'll see you next turn. <laughs>